for that. Appreciate it. All right, well, let's, let's pray, and then we'll um, jump back into the Gospel of John here. I'll pray with me. Lord, thank you um, for your word, the gift of it, Lord, for nourishment for our souls. And it's my prayer that that is um, what it provides this evening, Lord, that we um, leave this place nourished and fed through your word, Lord, and that it carries us throughout this week, throughout our lives, that it emboldens us to live out the realities of your gospel, Lord, not only in anticipation of being with you one day in heaven, Lord, but what it means for us now in this life. We ask all this in your son's name. Amen. All right, so we're going to be uh, finishing John chapter 3 this evening. So we're going to be looking at verses 22 through 36. We'll start by reading it, and then we'll uh, get into some context and things, and then and start moving through, through the passage together. So we'll start there. Verse 22, John the Apostle writes, he says, After this, Jesus and his disciples went into the Judean countryside, and he remained there with them and was baptizing. John was also baptizing at Aon, near Salim, because water was plentiful there, and people were coming and being baptized, for John had not yet been put in prison. Now a discussion arose between some of John's disciples and a Jew over purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you across the Jordan, to whom you bore witness, look, he is baptizing, and all are going to him. John answered, A person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given him from heaven. You yourselves bear witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom, who stands and hears him, rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this is the joy of mine is now complete. He must increase, but I must decrease. He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth belongs to the earth and speaks in an earthly way. He who comes from heaven is above all. He bears witness that to what he has seen and heard, yet no one receives his testimony. Whoever receives his testimony sets his seal to this, that God is true. For he whom God has sent utters the words of God, for he gives the Spirit without measure. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. And so I want to begin this evening by seeing John's main point here. Okay? Both John the Baptist's main point and John the Apostle, right? The writer of this gospel. Remember, there are two separate Johns. You have John, one of the the twelve disciples, an apostle, right? And then you have John the Baptist, this prophet that was preparing the way, was a forerunner for Jesus' ministry. And when we think about the main point of the text here, it's this, it's that Jesus is totally unique. Nothing compares, nothing and no one is greater. And so let's look back at the flow of chapter 2 and 3 here, and I want, to see, I want you to see how um, the Apostle John develops this idea. So remember, first of all, in chapter 1, we had that prologue, right? It was this introduction. It introduced the main themes. It introduced the main characters of the gospel here. But with chapters 2 and 3, a distinctive focus on the uniqueness and the supremacy of Jesus is going to be fleshed out further. And so first, in chapter 2, verses 1 through 12, we saw how Christ provides new wine that vastly surpasses anything that contemporary Judaism or Judaism at their time could afford or offer. And he rendered obsolete, symbolically, these stone jars of purification, right? You had people that were, had perverted the Old Covenant, were relying on, they thought they could literally keep the law of God in order to um, enter 
into a heavenly kingdom with him. They thought that they, I would be able to be right with God by being a good person. Jesus comes on the scene and is trying to re- remind them and bring them back to recall the realities of the gospel that is even shown in the Old Testament, that you can only be saved through faith. Right? We see this with the patriarchs. Hebrews 11 makes that clear. doesn't matter who it was. Moses, Abraham, Noah, all these men, David, they were saved by faith. They were not saved by keeping the law. Rather, the law was meant to reflect the character and nature of God, and it was meant to guide them towards a Savior. It showed them that they could not keep God's standard. Secondly, in verses 13 through 25 in chapter 2, we have the instance with Jesus clearing the temple, right? And what is that symbolic of? How does that relate to the uniqueness of Jesus? Well, he's displacing the temple there. He, and thereby, he in, intimates or um, he, in, uh, what's the word I want to use? He, he shows, we'll just keep it simple. He shows that the temple's proper role is to be seen as anticipating his role as mediator. Right? That, he's trying to get them to understand, hey, this is really the whole point of all of this, is me. These sacrifices are pointing to me. I'm the ultimate sacrifice, right? That's why he refers to the temple of his body, right? He's like, destroy this temple. I will raise it up in three days. He is supreme. He is the better sacrifice. He's the better temple. Third, in chapter three, we saw his encounter and interaction with Nicodemus, this high religious leader, political official, And in that, Jesus fulfills the prophecies of the Old Testament that we saw in like Ezekiel, for instance, talking about this relationship between water and spirit and regeneration, how it's not just cleansing, it's it's a whole new person, it's a whole new heart, it's a new nature, it's you must be born again. And then in verse 14 of chapter 3, specifically, Jesus is presented as the ultimate antitype of the snake that was lifted up in the desert, right? Remember in the Old Testament with that story how God was punishing the the children of Israel with poisonous snakes. But there was a bronze snake that he had the people attach to a pole and lift up, and anyone who looked upon that bronze snake would have physical healing from these snake bites, Well, Jesus juxtaposes himself to that or puts himself against or compares himself to that snake on a pole and is essentially saying, I'm greater than that. You found physical healing in that in the wilderness, but I provide ultimate healing, spiritual healing. And and also, I mean, we can see the connection there, right? Christ was lifted up, literally, on a cross to accomplish that, right? And those who simply look on him and believe and put their faith in what he did are spiritually healed. And lastly, with our text tonight, this evening, we see that Jesus surpasses John the Baptist. And any baptism or rite of purification that he may represent, Jesus is greater. Jesus is better. Well, let's think about an outline of this text here, verses 22 through 36. First of all, just notice in verse 22 through 25, you have the Apostle John, is, he's setting up the scene here. Right? He's bringing the, the disciples into play here. He's, he's letting us know that Jesus is, is coming into the Judean countryside. He lets us know what's going on, that Jesus' disciples are baptizing people, and also is John. And then in verse 26, we see this question arise from some of John's disciples. And then verses 27 through 29, in the first half of 29, John the Baptist answers their question. And then he makes his own assertions. Much like Jesus, right? People will ask him off-the-wall questions. Jesus realizes they totally are missing the point. And he answers them the way they need to be answered. Not necessarily answering what they wanted to know. And in verses 29, the second half of 29 through 30, we see the result, right? You see that therefore statement, right? 
And then verses 31 through 36, we see the narrative portion or the conversation is over and the Apostle John picks up and gives his own commentary. Right? And so, um, that's how we're going to progress through this. We're going to look at it in, in those, those little stages. Um, and this section of Scripture, I mean, a lot, all the Scripture is, but particularly this, is just rich with application to us. And so, before we look at some specific points of application, or specifically the message of John the Baptist and this, the narrator, John the Apostle, I just want to make a theological note here on the issue of baptism that's being talked about here. And it's this, is that the baptism that's being talked about here is fundamentally different than the baptism we celebrate in the New Covenant. Okay, Remember, the New Covenant has not been inaugurated at this point yet. Okay, um, They are still under the Old Covenant at this time when, when these events are taking place. And I don't want to spend too much time on this issue of baptism because it's not the focus of this passage. Right? Christ is. This text has a Christological focus. He is the main point here. It's not meant to develop a theology of baptism. There are other texts to go to to understand a new covenant understanding of baptism. But to understand what's going on here, let's talk about what it does mean. Okay, the baptism mentioned here, and by baptism we mean, well, physically it looks like ours, right? Putting people into water, raising them up, right, out of the water. Well, what are they symbolizing? Because they're kind of in this weird period where the old covenant is coming to an end, right? And the new covenant is on the cusp of being inaugurated. The Messiah is here. His kingdom has come. He is coming, right? He's here. So what does it mean? Well, it's essentially this, it's related to a kind of Old Testament symbolic washing of the outside to demonstrate a desire to be washed on the inside, to get ready for the Messiah's arrival and for his kingdom, right? Uh, there's a lot to go into it historically and theologically, but really like some things that probably came to these people's minds was the fact that the priests had to wash themselves, Ritually, to symbolically wash away any impurities before they um, were giving sacrifices or before the high priest went in to atone for the sins of Israel once a year. But the baptism we participate in today is symbolic of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. It identifies us with that, right? So this is Romans chapter 6. If you want to look at any specifics there. Obviously, though, that hasn't happened yet, right? Jesus isn't identifying these people with his death, burial, and resurrection because it hasn't happened yet. Rather, they are being identified with this symbolic purifying of themselves in anticipation for the coming Messiah, for his kingdom, right? And so that's why the text here says that they got into this conversation about pur purification, because of all these underlying ideas that the Jews would have had, right? Both biblical and some unbiblical. We know that the Jews were fond of, um, at least in this period, of adding all sorts of weird things, coming up with strange things. You had different schools of thought that were intruding, right? So all sorts of weird conversations could arise about this baptism. And I want us to look at this um, as we move through this text, I want us to look at it in two ways. First, we're going to see how John the Baptist asserts the uniqueness and the supremacy of Christ. And secondarily, we're going to see how the Apostle John, his commentary in verses 31 through 36, how he asserts the uniqueness and the supremacy of Christ. So to start, verse 27 is where John gives his answer. And what's he giving his answer to? Well, this discussion, verse 25, a discussion arose between some of John's disciples and a Jew over purification. And he's, uh, he's uh, affronted with this foolish assertion 
that arose out of these needless concerns and conversations. You might ask, well, how do you know that? It just says they had a discussion. Well, the word there, it really carries the, the undertones of talking about a worthless conversation. Um, it's, it's a word that's used to denote like controversy or needless speculation. And I just want us to think about this, for instance. We encounter people like this all the time, okay? And we're always going to encounter people like this. And I just want us to take a minute and think through this here. Because engaging with people like this, that engage in foolish speculations or controversies, it's a waste of time to deal with people like that, okay? It's a waste of time to engage with them. Paul tells us in 2 Timothy 2.23 not to engage in stupid or foolish discussions or controversies. It's the same word. The word for discussions used here is the same word used for foolish controversies there in 2 Timothy 2.23. And, that, and that's the thing. We're going to see here that John doesn't engage in this foolish conversation. He says what he knows needs to be said. But he doesn't get himself mixed up in, in that, right? And we see, these kind, we see what these kind of conversations lead to. Notice, these disciples of John, these followers of John the Baptist, what's happened? Because of these foolish discussions, they have totally missed the point of why John's ministry even existed. They are concerned more um, about people going to Jesus, which is ironic because, as John points out, they bore witness to who Jesus was. <laughs> But because of these foolish conversations, these discussions, these speculations with a Jew over purification, they have missed the whole point of what's going on. And just think about that practically. I mean, y'all have probably experienced this, um, especially when it's like some off-the-wall person or something. Um, even here, in, in this context, will come in. They have all sorts of crazy assertions, ideas, and stuff. And quickly, they distort everything we're doing here. <laughs> they take our time away um, that could be spent talking about uplifting things, admonishing things, right? And they just go into all sorts of foolish controversies and ideas, right? I'm going to be honest with you guys. Don't entertain that. There are things that we are to be focused on, not those things. And so John begins to answer them in verse 27. John says, a person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given him from heaven. So this is a very broad, universal truth, a maxim, if you will. Um, advice, not really advice, it's a statement, it's, a, it's an assertion. So maxim, or a maxim is probably an appropriate way to, to say it. And John wants them to understand one thing. He wants them to understand that everything a person receives comes from God who is sovereign over all. And contextually, he's specifically talking about his ministry, right? And not only just his ministry, but his role in redemptive history. What do we mean by redemptive history? Well, that quite literally is the history um, of God redeeming his people, right? It's the study of or the look at how God, through the Bible, through history, redeems people. And so John knows that his own ministry, his own place in that moment in time to prepare the way for Jesus, for the coming King, for the Messiah, that is a gift from God. That is, God is sovereign over that. And this is very applicable to us, specifically, especially as a small house church, right? Because here's the thing, it would be foolish 
and I've done this before personally, and it is foolish, it would be foolish for us to look at a larger church and envy them just because more people are going there, right? That's my rice. Can you turn that off, Janelle? Thank you. Um, so, it would be foolish. There, there are, now, let's, let's think about this practically. In Southwest Houston, there, there just simply are not a lot of gospel-affirming churches. Um, like I said before, I've, I can count on both hands in Southwest Houston an area of about 700,000 people. And I can count on two hands the amount of churches I know that are gospel-affirming churches. And, but it would be foolish for us to look at the ones that are larger, that are doing well, like University Park, which is right here down the road, um, dear brothers and sisters in Christ, right? They, they are doing great things for the Lord. But I never want to look at their ministry and the pastors there and envy them, right? I don't, I don't, want, I don't want us to be like, oh my goodness, like, look at all the people going over there. What's going on, right? Why? Well, God has that church and their attendance for His own purposes, If the gospel is being proclaimed there and people are seeking the Lord and they're seeking His will, we should have no quarrel with them simply because more people go there. Now, if there's a church that are drawing people through false means right, and their pastors are wolves in sheep's clothing, that's a different issue. We want to be faithful to preach the word um, and love on those people and, and call them out of that, right? But with churches that are around us, that are larger, but are seeking the Lord and preaching the gospel, we want to always remember what God has called us to do as Redeemer's love, right? We're a small house church, and as we grow, it's our vision that we want to plant more house churches. We have jettisoned kind of the traditional church planning motto where we would start renting a space and then buy some land and build a church, mainly because... There's no land to build around here. And the land that is available, my goodness, we'd be raising money for 20 years. So, we see this working better. And it helps us keep um, gospel issues central. Discipleship central. And this is all just fine, right? Being a house church, planning house churches, it's fine. This is our place in God's redemptive plan. And here's the thing, if it's not, right, if, if this wasn't God's will for us, we can't thwart his will. So <laughs> if he wanted us in a building, he's going to get us into one, right? But, um, well, if that's what he wants to do, then he'll do it. <laughs> it's that simple, right? We don't have to sit here and agonize over like, oh, what does the Lord want us to do? What does the Lord want us to do? Well, we know what the Lord is, wants us to do. He wants us to be faithful. He wants us to preach the gospel, to admonish one another, right? To call this um, community and city to repentance, right? And if that involves planting a bunch of house churches, glory to God. If that involves growing into a building, glory to God, right? Believe me, I'm not sitting in my room at night waiting for a little whisper telling me where to buy land and, and things like that, okay? So, next... John makes that okay. John makes that very emphatically clear. Okay, whatever comes to you is from God. He is sovereign. Nothing is outside of his gifting or his control, including John the Baptist's ministry and his place in redemptive history. And that's the same for us, right? Next, John in verse twenty-eight, he calls to memory their own confession of his ministry. Right. He says, you yourselves bear witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. He's trying um, to help them remember the very thing that they've already asserted. And we need to keep that in mind. There's a lot of times where we assert things, say we believe things, right? And very quickly, we'll forget it. We'll forget it to the point where we're acting like this. We're getting in foolish conversations over random things about Jewish purification rites. 
right? And there are people that will still argue about that. Um, and the next thing we know, we're asking foolish questions like these guys are. But notice how he kind of he puts this in, in terms of an analogy, right? Verse 29, he says, The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom, talking about himself, right? Who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. So his point here is that there is about to be, in their time, there is about to be a great wedding that is to take place. Christ is the groom. The church, the people of God, are his bride, right? And as a result, he's asserting that it would be foolish, not only in a real wedding, but in this figurative sense, it would be foolish for him as a friend of the bride to be jealous rather than being overcome with joy at the coming wedding of Christ to his bride, the church, right? And this is why he says, these are very famous words, people repeat them all the time, especially guys in higher up ministry positions, they want to use this as a means of humility, right? They quote John when he says, he must increase, but I must decrease, verse 30. Interestingly, though, I think this is a statement of fact, more than like a suggestion. Usually, it gets quoted as or it gets thrown around as like someone's saying, I'm going to do this, right? Because of my position in ministry, I must decrease myself so that Christ might increase. That's usually how it's phrased by people. Their heart's in the right place there, I think, when, when they're saying that, but John's point is not necessarily that he's going to be the one that withdraws himself so that Jesus can take his place. Rather, it's a statement. He's saying Christ will increase. He must increase. And I must decrease. And this is because Christ doesn't seek man's opinion. He doesn't wait for us to act Okay, Jesus was not just kind of wandering around being like, okay, John, your ministry needs to wind down. Let's, let's let this go. I'm, I'm waiting here. I need to start doing what I'm doing. That, Jesus wasn't acting that way. God, um, he does whatever he sovereignly wills to accomplish when he wants to do it. God simply does. He acts. He, he's not sitting around twiddling his thumbs waiting for us to do certain things. Okay? He's not dependent on man. And so Christ's ministry would increase. And John's ministry does decrease. And so then we end the kind of the story or the conversation. And verse 31 takes us into the Apostle John's commentary on what just happened. And he makes a couple of important points. First, he makes it clear that Christ is above all. Right? Verse 31, He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth belongs to the earth and speaks in an earthly way. He who comes from heaven is above all. There's a famous quote from Abraham Kuyper, not Piper, Kuyper, okay? Piper's great, but Kuyper is older, cooler, and dead theologians are usually better. So, Abraham Kuyper, he says this. He says, there is not one square inch of the universe over which the risen Christ does not cry, mine. So there's not one square inch over which Jesus, as Lord and King of the universe, cannot point to and say, that, that is mine. It is all His. Every grain of sand, every particle, every atom, it's His. I mentioned this last week. There are no rogue molecules in God's universe. Everything has been created by Him and for Him. How do we know that? Well, this text, but Paul provides 
some very good commentary on this. Let's look at Colossians real quick. Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 20. Paul writes, he says he, he's talking about Jesus. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. So Christ is supreme overall. And I don't think I can provide better commentary than Paul. So I will let those words stand for themselves. And notice here what else he says. That verse 32, He bears witness to what he has seen and heard, yet no one receives his testimony. Whoever receives his testimony sets his seal to this, that God is true. So those who receive the testimony of Christ, it's simple. They, they acknowledge that God is true. As Hebrews puts it, Hebrews 11, that they acknowledge that God is. Right? He, he simply is. He exists. And in verse 34, he writes, For he whom God has sent, utters the words of God. For he gives the Spirit without measure. Okay, so this, the Spirit of God has been poured out fully by God the Father on God the Son. Okay, we saw this earlier, right? With the baptism that John the Baptist did for Jesus. We see the Father speaking. We see the Holy Spirit. He comes down in the form of a dove, and rests on top of Jesus, right? And Jesus is there. We see the triune God there, together, acting in redemptive history. And John is saying that God now gives the Spirit without limit. Which is different than what we saw in the Old Covenant, right? In the Old Covenant, you'll see God, the Spirit of God, He will dwell in or He will rest upon people periodically, for periods of time. He will come and go from people. But with the coming of the new covenant, the Spirit is given without limit. So again, really we are seeing here the Trinitarian nature of Christ's mission. This is a work of the Father, this is the work of the Son, and the Holy Spirit here. Uh, a technical note there, you know, especially in our context here in Southwest Houston, this is why the heresy of modalism is so dangerous. Okay, if you run into like oneness Pentecostals and things, they're going to have this idea that God existed like as the Father, then Jesus, and now as like the Holy Spirit. Okay, the problem with that is, is all through Scripture it shows the work of God to be triune, at the same time working together, right? Not one after the other, or only one for one time and then another one for another time. Okay, you simply can't understand texts like this if God exists in modes. And so, with those two perspectives in mind, how John the Baptist shows the supremacy of Christ and how John the Apostle shows the supremacy of Christ, let's look at some application here. First, I don't want us to miss Jesus for the sake of following a particular teacher or theologian or a system of theology. Okay? Even if they are very good teachers, even if they are very good theologians or the system's great. Okay? Um, I'm not knocking those things. I think those things are healthy for the church. I think denomination distinctions are good. Um, they help us to understand what each other believes. They help us to understand 
Um, yeah, to understand what each other believes and to have better conversation. Um, it's very easy if somebody comes up to me, you know, and they're like, yeah, I'm a Christian. Oh, I'm a Christian too. Where do you go to church? And they're like, oh, I go to such and such Presbyterian church. I'm like, okay, I, I immediately know that if they're a faithful member of that church and they ascribe to Presbyterian doctrine, that we are, we're brothers in Christ. Like, we, we affirm the gospel together. And I also know that we might have some different opinions on things like baptism or church polity, right? That's okay. It helps our conversation be more fruitful. It helps our congregations not be at odds, and we can further the gospel together in different areas. So, but here's the thing. Some of John's disciples, so we're looking at verses 22 through 28 again. We're going to kind of go back again and walk back through it with some application. So verses 22 through 28. Some of John's disciples were so focused on him and his ministry, that they missed the one whom he was preparing the way for. And we would be foolish to look at them and just think, what a bunch of idiots. Because, goodness, we do the same things. We're just as fallen and sinful as them. We're just as human as them. We're still prone to the same things, right? Here's the thing, though. God himself in human flesh, Christ Jesus, right, was in front of them, literally, and they missed him. And what he was doing because they were falsely devoted in a wrong way to John the Baptist. Their devotion to him had become perverted. Right? So I bring this up as a warning, mainly because by God's grace, I'm seeing so many of, of y'all begin to embrace reading from good theologians and good teachers, you're, you're understanding systematic theology well. Um, I want that to continue. I want that to flourish. But I want us to be careful, right? Because we have a, theolo- or we have a culture here where theology is adored, right? Where theologians like, like Calvin, Edwards, Alistair Begg, MacArthur, Piper, Sproul, all those kinds of guys, they produce great work. And they're great men of God, or were. But they would never wish, just as John the Baptist didn't wish, they would never wish, and we should never end up missing Christ in pursuit of them or various theological systems. Right? Good way to guard yourself against this is if you are confused about something biblically or an issue theologically and you just kind of have your guy that you just run to, I'm going to check his website real quick. And whatever he says, you're just like, okay, got it. That's a good way to to see that you might just be focused more on what this theologian is going to tell me than what Christ might actually be saying in his word. Okay? If you're comparing things, if you're looking at, okay, I, I understand his point there, but what does somebody else say? Right? Um, and, if, and you should be doing this with David and I as well. Right? Just because we say it from here, we are not infallible. Right? The word of God is, we are not. We are capable of error. Amen. Okay? Yes, we are. You know? And so you need to test what we say with the word of God. You need to be Bereans, right? Like the book of Acts would say. There are many people I run into, lovely people. They're rightly devoted, right, to the leadership of their pastors. That's great. That's good, right? Commanded that in Scripture. But there's a problem when we talk about an issue or a theological idea and someone just says, well, my pastor says, well, my pastor says. Okay, well, that's nice. What does God's Word say? Okay, Did your pastor help you to understand that out of God's word? And then can you articulate that with me? Okay. So, we need to keep this in mind. We need to be careful of where our allegiance is. We need to keep our allegiance with Christ, right? To Christ. Secondly, what I want us to see here in verse 29, John the Baptist talks about this idea that You know, he's the friend of the bridegroom, Jesus is the bridegroom, and the church is his bride. 
That's what I want you to see. If you're a believer here today, you're part of the church. You are the bride. You are right here in this text that we are reading. And Paul makes it very clear in Ephesians 5, right? That the church is the bride of Christ. There shouldn't be any debate about that. And what's the focus of the mission for which Jesus came to this earth? Was it not to come to lay his life down for his sheep, for his church, right? That was the focus of his mission. And so don't miss that there. John kind of makes that a passing statement. He wants them to understand that he is the friend of the bride. Jesus is the focus. But man, we need to understand that we're the bride. And Christ died for us, gave his life up for us. And then verses 35 through 36. Notice the connection here. John the Apostle writes, he says, The Father loves the Son and has given all things into His hand. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. So there's a connection being made here. And it's this. God loves us because He loves the Son. We are offered eternal life because the Father loves the Son and has given all things into His hand. And this is a crucial thing to understand. Not only just be theologically accurate, right? To not be self-centered as human beings. And just like I talked about last week, not to think that God came to save us because we're just amazing people, right? We're not, and that's not why he came to save us. Because here's here's the question. If, If we understand our theology correctly, if we understand human nature correctly, How could the Father love miserable, wretched sinners like us? And if you were wondering when I was going to remind you that you're bad, this is it. I'm going to do it each week. We're bad, okay? So how how does the Father love miserable, wretched sinners like us? It's because He loves the Son, right? It's the same issue, the same conundrum, the legal conundrum of how a righteous, good judge like God could pardon evil people, right? Typically, if, an, if a judge pardons an evil person, like a murderer or something, the town erupts. They, they get mad. They're like, that's an evil judge. So how can God, the judge of the universe, pardon wicked people? Well, it's because justice is still done. Jesus takes our sin and he dies the death we deserve. He takes the wrath of God we deserve, and justice is done. His righteousness is imputed to us. Our sin is imputed to Him. And God is just. So, here's the thing. If you're a believer here today, God loves you because He loves His Son. Some people might push back against that a little bit and say, well, that's kind of demeaning. That doesn't help me out. The problem is, it, it really it should help you out in a lot of ways. Because here's the thing. Because God loves you, because He loves His Son, that means that God's love for you, it's consistent, it's eternal, and it's secure. It's not because you're just some great person. It's because Christ is perfect and pure and because He's supreme. Getting real practical here. Do you struggle with like self-doubt? Do you struggle with identity issues? or Do you just feel down about yourself? I think if you're a human being, you're going to experience that. But as Christians, we look to Christ to know our value and our worth. What does the world do? The world looks inward. When someone is, is going through a crisis or an identity crisis or they're just... Um, they're suffering from depression that might not necessarily be medically induced, right? Because that is a reality, right? If, if, it's, if it's purely maybe just the way they're thinking about themselves and things, what does the world do? They try to puff that person up. They try to essentially tell them, like, hey, why are you down about yourself? You're the greatest thing that's ever you know, been around since sliced bread. Like, what would the world do without you? 
Well, it would keep on spinning. That's the problem. And deep down, we know it. The world looks inward, and what do they end up doing? They are essentially spraying perfume on a dead corpse, and then they parade it around as if it's beautiful and perfect. That's what they do. They, like, they stick sticks into the limbs of your spiritually dead body, and they pick it up, and they're like, look, look at the arms waving, and look, oh, put some lipstick on them, they fix their hair, look, oh, you're so beautiful, you're so great, yay, be happy. And then it doesn't work, and we wonder why our culture is just diving into depression and suicide and all sorts of horrific realities. Because the world's attempt to fix the inward problem by pointing us back into ourselves doesn't work. We don't look inward as Christians because we know who and what we are apart from Christ. The last thing I want to do is <laughs> look at myself. If I'm down about myself, the last thing I want to do is look in my inward self. This is going to make it worse. We look to Christ for identity. We look to Christ for our purpose. Because guess what? He doesn't change. Who he is is constant. And our identity in him then is secure. It's constant. It's always the same. It's not going to change. God is no longer at war with us. We are no longer at enmity with him. We are no longer enemies of him because of what Christ has done. And so 1 Peter comments on this. He proclaims this. He says, 1 Peter says, We are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. That is something to hold on to when times are tough, when seasons of darkness kind of come around you. That is what we hold on to. We hold on to who Christ is, and as a result, what that now means, who I am. And then, of course, to close here, we can't leave this section of Scripture, or really any section of Scripture, without realizing that the point of this it's a call to believe if you do not already. Those of here, you here today that you don't know Christ, you need to understand this gospel is written for you. John's gospel, right? We, we see this um, in the final comments in his, uh, was it chapter 20, right? John tells us that he has written these things so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God and that by believing you may have life in his name. In John's final comments in this narrative that we're looking at here, verse 36, it ties all of this together to the central, this central goal, this central aim. He says, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. Two options lay before you. If you do not know Christ today, we're glad you're here, but two options lay before you. Two options have laid before every man, since Adam even. Eternal life through Christ, or the wrath of God, which, the wrath of God, you are already presently under, only in a restrained form. And you don't want to be around when it's let loose. We, we desire that all men would come into the presence of God as friends of Him and not enemies. Because the reality to step into the presence of God one day after you die as an enemy of Him will only obligate Him as a good judge to treat you as an enemy, to judge you. But He offers friendship to you. He offers sonship to you. Through faith in Christ, right? So specifically, let's think about this. With the narrative of verses 22 through 30. Okay, let's think about that there. With that in mind, before John's narrative section. 
we are called by John the Apostle to see the supremacy of Christ. We're called to see his mission above all others, even John the Baptist's mission of preparing the way for the promised Messiah. He is greater. Simply put, here's the reality of it. We've all sinned against a holy, good, and righteous God. This means that we all deserve His eternal wrath. But He offers eternal life through faith. And what is faith? Well, Faith is trust in the work of Christ on the cross. It's not just whimsical belief. Okay? Many people have a really bad idea of what faith really is. It's not just a whimsical belief in whatever. Faith, well, Hebrews 11 tells us what it is. It's the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Assurance and conviction are ideas of like something real, something tangible that you're actually putting your faith in. It's, a, it's trust, and it's trust in something and someone. It's trust in Christ and what He did on the cross. And that sacrifice is very real, and it's actually effective at dealing with your sin. There is no other means offered by any other religion, any other philosophy, to deal with the evil of the world and to deal with sin. All of it is inadequate. It's all either human perfectionism, it's this idea of you can be a good enough person, it's globalism, right? Or this idea that we can build this world into some sort of utopia. None of it actually deals with evil. The cross of Jesus dealt with evil. So, the Word of God, it calls on you today to believe. Don't rely on yourself for salvation. Believe in Christ, and He will save you from your sins and from the wrath of God. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this evening and this time together. It's my prayer that your word um, would speak deeply to our hearts, those of us that don't know you here today, Lord, that you would call us to repentance and faith in you. That at the hearing of your word, we would respond to it, Lord. We just ask that you'd call those to you and save them, God. We ask that you bless the food that we're about to eat, and continue to just bless this church and everything that you are giving us, Lord. It's in your son's name I pray. Amen.